Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Andreas Junger. He is Professor for Political Science with a focus on the governance of complex and innovative technical systems at Otto Friedrich University Bamberg. He examines the impact of digital media on politics and society. He, he has worked on the uses of digital media and technology by publics, political actors and organizations in international comparison. He is the author of books like Retooling Politics and the role, uh, and, sorry, uh, and Analyzing Political Communication with Digital Trace Data. So Dr. Junger, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Yeah, thank you so much, Ricardo Lopes. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Okay, great. So uh, let me start by asking you, so uh, the way political discourse operates online, I mean, is it the same as offline or are there any important differences? Yeah, that that is that is a great question because I think that is that is one of the um, things that have changed a lot in the um, if, if you like in the in the way we experience discourse, and also the way that that discourse topics are so evolved. And I think I mean if we're thinking from the individual side, so um, so 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 how does for example the way we exchange views or how do we talk about politics? Um, there, there, of course, the online environment or digital environments uh, change the way we we experience discourse. Because uh, on the one hand, we can never be sure whom we are talking to. Um, so, so this might be a question of anonymity or, or at least pseudo anonymity. Um, so that we're never really sure who our um, uh, interlocutors are. Um, and and I think that makes makes it difficult with regard to accountability of talk. So if we're talking face to face um, or if we're talking in kind of a, if you like in a, in a public forum or so, um, then 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 we are recognizable and, and we are also kind of accountable for what we're saying. If we're doing that in digital environments, um, of course, there is some uh, some continuity to the accounts or to the names that we're using, but it's much more difficult to, to actually identify the person behind that. And um, and I think that has consequences for uh, for for discourse, um, where where we're always talking about okay, one one person, one vote, or one person, one opinion, or, uh, or also uh, where we try to challenge the other with regard to um, the, um, the 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 opinions that they're holding or the um, uh, the the information that they're putting out. And I think that has become much more difficult um, in digital environments. On the other hand, now that 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 is then associated with some of the dangers or kind of the the negative aspects or aspects of political talk um, in digital environments, but there are also massive chances or opportunities connected with that, because if you if you imagine now you you hold a minority opinion um, in a society that 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 is quite restrictive uh, towards minority opinions, um, but you voice them online. Um, then you can actually kind of form a support group on that or others can support that opinion that otherwise would remain silent. So if you're thinking about LGBTQ rights um, or, or minorities, political minorities and autocracies, um, I think there are um, there are a lot of um, positive aspects also connected with that. So, so if you're thinking about these consequences of these digital environments, we, we have to be very careful on the one hand to see the opportunities, but also then the, the dangers. And I think currently we're overestimating uh, the dangers that are connected with that and somewhat lose sight um, of, of the benefits that might be connected with this. Mm -hmm. But I mean, by people interacting online uh, in a political manner, I mean, having some political discourse, the, having political discussions online and so on, interacting with other people about politics, does that have any effect on how they conduct themselves politically offline? I mean, is there some sort of influence? I think that is that is an interesting question that we that we actually as scientists have to look much more closely uh, towards because um, I think currently at the moment we know very little about this. So so we at the on the one hand we're speculating um, a lot that um, a rougher mode of discourse or rougher exchanges online might lead to to more extremism or might actually 
uh, spill over into into actual violence um, offline. Um, so so this could be. But then the question is, are we uh, are we basically talking about people who have these tendencies towards political violence, who then are online and exchanging views and and then feel some sort of justification to um, to execute on these tendencies? Um, or are we really talking about people who um, who are just kind of interested in politics or, or in gaming and then start talking and then over time become um, become become radicalized or become um, more um, more interested in these topics and then um, become, if you like, more extreme uh, in offline environments? And I think if we're looking um, at the studies, at least that I'm aware of, um, I think it's difficult to 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 identify kind of a a societal effect or an effect that is that is there for uh, for large populations. Um, but uh, but on the other hand, it, it might actually be that that there is a real um, danger for individuals who have specific psychological um, inclinations or or, or or vulnerable towards towards radicalization, who then in these kind of digital environments, um, become kind of more um, more extreme or kind of go down a rabbit hole um, that is connected with that. And I think the um, the extremism literature or the literature on on, on actually terrorism um, um, is is I think the literature that is that is most most developed on on this in this regard. Um, and 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 I think we're talking here. Not necessarily about a society-wide uh, phenomenon that is um, that the average citizen or so might be might be in danger there, um, but but it's probably a, a danger that is holding for specific individuals, and I think that is something that we have to um, also as a, a scientist and society have to address uh, from the regard from kind of interventions um, or also the psychology of radicalism. Um, I think there are areas that have to be. Um, um, much more diligently uh, investigated there. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I was just trying to understand if, I mean, the kind of discourse surrounding social media, for example, we hear mainly from journalists and political commentators where they say that we have enough or more than enough evidence to say that uh, social media or online platforms contribute to political polarization and contribute to political extremism and uh, exposure to fake news, misinformation have real uh, behavioral effects on people's lives outside of the online platforms and stuff like that. I mean, I was just trying to understand if that's really the case, if we have solid evidence of that, or if when people say that they are perhaps exaggerating, or we still do not have enough evidence to definitely conclude that. I think, I mean, it's, it's, a, diff it's a difficult question uh, regarding the causality. And, and, and personally, I feel, I mean, we, we are currently in, in, a, in a situation where we see a lot of people online where we see a lot of the, the 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 problematic aspects of online behavior, um, and at the same time we we see um, we see political extremism, especially in the U.S. or predominantly in the U.S., um, kind of uh, breaking way. So it's easy to make that connection, because a lot of the I mean, if you're thinking about the Capitol riots, for example, in the U.S., um, of course, a lot of these people were were before the riots were online and were exchanging um, exchanging views and opinions there. But the question that that um, regarding the the causality is does then does this discourse um, make them into uh, into or, or motivate them to um, to storm the capital or is that something more like um, the actual social ties that these people have, and um, and the and, and and the interactions that they have there. So so of course, kind of modern radicalism or political radicalism is happening online. But the question then becomes, okay, is is that the real driver of this? And and I think if we're looking at, it's a little bit like uh, like the old video game question. So um, you have a lot of school scooters, uh, a lot of uh, school shooters. Who, are, who have been playing ego shooters, um, but uh, but you have basically um, thousands more uh, or millions more of, uh, of 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 shooter players 
who don't go out and 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 um, and commit violence or um, in uh, in the real world. So so I think there the the, the question then also holds um, for for discourse or so where where a lot of us are actually online and exchanging views uh, on politics, uh, but but most of us never really um, get drawn into that rabbit hole of of extremism. Um, and if you're thinking, for example, about disinformation or fake news, um, personally, the most fake news that I encountered was when media was talking about fake news that was happening online. So, so I wasn't necessarily exposed to the fake news um, or the disinformation in online environments. I was exposed to it because people went out there looking for it and then actually showed showed it um, on uh, on the traditional media. So. Um, so I would argue probably the this kind of causal connection um, is, is at least my impression is uh, the evidence is not really convincing that this is there. Um, I think what is real and what what we what we nearly what we really should talk uh, should be talking about is kind of the social drivers of, if you like, in the U.S. political polarization or a more um, more heated way of of argument or that that. Um, um, also in, in, in other Western democracies that you have um, sizable minorities who do not feel represented anymore um, by, um, by, by the democratic um, forces or by the traditional media. So, so that is something that we need to talk about. And personally, I don't think that the digital media is the driver of these differences, but it's the challenge, uh, the channel that these kind of um, uh, concerns are, are then, uh, then formed. So, it's probably a political problem or social problem uh, that uh, that that finds way on technology, um, and and so we actually have to address the driving issues and and not be distracted from the technology aspect. Mm -hmm. So in this case, the technology and the online platforms could be simply a manifestation of something that is already occurring in society and is caused by other factors, like, for example, political, economic, social factors and things like that. Exactly, exactly. And and of course, there might be specific aspects of technology that that work as accelerators there um, or that 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 actually weaken social structures that in the past would have worked um, in mediating these conflicts. Um, so, so I think there's a very good argument there that um, that that because of digital technology, the role of political parties or the role of um, of the media has been weakened. Uh, that in the past might have kind of helped in solving these um, social uh, social and political problems without them kind of then um, going kind of head to head um, in, in in direct conflict. Um, so so that th th there might be a case there. Um, and there, there also might be a case that once you once you then um, follow a given or if you have a specific inclination that you then, of course, are able in digital environments to find information that support that view um, and others who um, who support you in this. Um, so so all these are factors that are probably contributing to this. Um, but 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 I would be more hesitant in um, in pointing to them to them as the root cause of the problem. So so I would say. The issues that we're seeing right now and that we're concerned with, if Mark Zuckerberg could snap his fingers and um, and have a magic AI solution that um, that that kills hostility uh, online, then we still would have um, the the underlying root causes uh, that we would have to address. <laughs> but do we know if social media uh, have changed in any way how polit politics is done in real life? I mean, I'm not referring to the behavior of common citizens, but the behavior of politicians. I mean, in terms of their using the social media platforms for campaigns and publicity and so on, did it have any impact on how politics is done? Yeah, very much so. So, 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 so I would argue that 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 basically the the practice, the everyday practice of politics, has been um, has been very much affected by digital media, and um, and on the one hand, uh, that is connected with the with with the resources that you can generate as a as a politician. So, if you're thinking about the U.S., um, I mean, one of the, the 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 reasons why digital media got so big and um, or digital technology got so big in American campaigns was 
because it was uh, it was possible to generate um, a lot of donations through um, through digital media. And actually, the first guy who found that out was was John McCain, um, uh, I think, in a Senate race. So um, so um, so so those um, those are cases where where you see that it's possible to um, to step away from the from the party machine or the the, the party hierarchy to be able to generate donations independently of this. And, um, and for example, in the case of Barack Obama, um, we, we all talked about this as something very, very positive because you had a very energetic young candidate um, who, um, who represented um, a change to democratic politics and um, and 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 was was a real um, was was a real kind of sign of hope uh, for many people. And he was enabled in his in his presidential run by the support and by the fund um, by the donations that he got online. And that made him somewhat independent of the Democratic Party machine, who at that time probably would have um, preferred another candidate. So um, so we see that as as a potential of uh, of energizing political discourse. On the other hand, and the, the maybe more problematic um, side, it's um, it, it also enables politicians that uh, that that we that we do not necessarily feel comfortable with. So um, so if you're thinking about um, about Donald Trump, Donald Trump didn't need the resources uh, that that digital media provided him with. But he used it to um, to get attention, to get media attention, and 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 thereby kind of moving around the um, uh, the, the the power or the hierarchy, the party hierarchy that would probably also prefer not to have him as a as a leading candidate at the time. So um, so what digital media have done, they have enabled individuals who um, are, for example, maybe especially charismatic. Have a very very good narrative, or have strong organizing power, or strong base, um, to to circumvent um, hierarchies or, or power centers, um, and become part of politics. That does not have to be good. That doesn't have to be bad. That is always connected with the with a specific candidate who who capitalizes on this. Um, but but that definitely has changed. And I think the other thing that has changed, and that is also very important, um, if we're thinking about politics. Um, Many people have started to look at digital media as a representation of political opinion. Um, so we know from from research in the U.S., for example, Shan McGregor has done um, a lot of work on this, that a lot of journalists are, um, are continuously looking um, at, at at social media dashboards that show them which type of um, which term is trending, which candidate is mentioned a lot. Um, so, so that political coverage is actually starting to be driven by, um, or was driven um, by, um, by, by social media activity, and 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 that is of course an, an interesting, um, interesting question because at the moment we're not necessarily sure um, what type of opinions get amplified that way, and and what is maybe kind of um, what type of opinions or views. Gets uh, get get silenced um, if we're thinking about uh, digital media communication. So it might be that um, that a lot of um, some of the personalization or some of the more scandalous driven um, coverage might be actually a kind of a reaction to uh, to to stuff that trends well on Twitter. Um, and 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 since journalists are looking at that um, and incorporating that in the coverage, then politicians start producing that type of content. Um, to be uh, to be visible there and and to get their voice, and and on the one hand, what goes for journalists, of course, also goes for the politicians themselves, um, who uh, who who also are kind of test driving uh, messengers, so um, or, or, or talking points. Um, so that is maybe not necessarily happening on on Twitter so much, but this is definitely happening on on, on Facebook on the Facebook pages where they are trying to hone in. Okay, what type of position works? What type of Phrasing gets good reactions or bad reactions from my base, um, and 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 they're reacting to that too. So, um, so so what we're seeing is that digital media becomes kind of on the one end a um, kind of an amplifier um, and um, of politics or a mediator of politics, where um, where what trends there well also um, might then start influencing media coverage or or campaign practices. Um, and again, 
this could be good. Um, um, but but then on the other hand, this can also kind of lead to a more kind of um, well event driven or scandal driven uh, coverage dynamic. Right. But do we know if online political advertisement and campaigns work? Do we know if they are effective in, for example, changing people's political preferences and more specifically their voting behavior? Mm -hmm. I think um, it's with with a lot of um, uh, with it's like with a lot of um, communicative content um, or with advertising that that probably every single item only has a very very small effect. So um, so so I'm not necessarily sure if if the effect that we should be looking for um, of online ads or online campaign activity is necessarily in changing votes. Um, it's probably more about, on the one hand, kind of driving the narrative of a campaign, um, and 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 also on the other hand, in 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 getting in in reaching people who might otherwise have dropped out of politics. So, um, if you're thinking about the role of digital media in driving um, driving the narrative of a campaign, um, you can of course use digital media as a as a campaign and and with your with your larger, if you like, societal uh, supporter network um, to push specific topics, to push specific images, um, and, and also to push back against narratives that you're finding in the media or by, by political elites. And your hope would be then to, um, to basically create an, an, an online shadow or kind of a counter narrative um, to, to what is happening, for example, uh, on TV or in big media events. So, uh, so there's a very nice article by, by Daniel Kreese on this, um, where he talks about how the Obama campaign used Twitter um, to, uh, to counteract um, a, a convention speech by Clint Eastwood, where Clint Eastwood was talking to, um, uh, to, to an empty chair um, to, uh, to illustrate in his mind that, well, um, Obama wasn't really present as a, as a president. And, um, and and this happened during the Republican convention. There was a lot of attention on this. Um, and, and and traditionally that means as a campaign, well, you cannot, I mean, the other, the, others, the, the other person has the mic. You cannot really engage with that. And the Obama campaign um, at that point just posted a, um, a, a, a tweet pic of Obama sitting um, in, um, in a chair from the back. And then it's basically said, uh, on the back of the chair, it said president, and then uh, the tweet read, uh, "This chair is taken," um, and and uh, then the narrative in the in the media the next day uh, was all about how how cool that intervention was and and how problematic or how um, uh, how misguided Clint Eastwood's um, convention speech was. So so I think this is a very simple example um, that that shows the dynamic how you can be using. Um, digital media to to kind of challenge other narratives and 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 try to um, 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 kind of capture the narrative there. Um, in Germany, we had an example from the recent campaign where um, where the leading candidate of the Conservatives, Armin Laschet, um, he was at a we had a big flooding event and um, and uh, and he was. Um, unfortunately, laughing um, while while visiting uh, the the flooding areas, and this was just kind of one moment in in a in a long um, in a long day full of tension, full of sadness, and then somebody cracked a joke, and and the candidate laughed. So um, from a human perspective, you could be saying, well, this is actually very very humanizing, um, but then um, the moment and the image that that emerged was about somebody who. Who basically didn't know how to behave in a situation like this, um, and 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 this was kind of um, amplified a lot through through online uh, communication, then moved into the uh, into the traditional media coverage, and actually then turned out to define the candidate for a lot of people, um, and 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 his campaign actually never got can, never got over this moment, and and I think there we have a case where digital media are not alone. But digital media in kind of connection with traditional media coverage and kind of strategic interventions by political actors um, are, are, are very, very um, powerful in shaping images, shaping narratives. Um, so I think in, in these areas, you, you have a strong effect that you uh, that you can um, develop there. Um, 
and that then of course has an effect later on on the ballot box but it's not like you are you, you have that one cool ad that really shifts opinion um it's more about kind of kind of a continued interaction and intervention and in, in, in how you engage with the with the evolving narrative and trying to shift it in your favor mm -hmm. do we know if there's any correspondence between the kinds of political opinions people express online and the kind of political content they share and create and their actual political preferences and support for example is it possible for us to know the kinds of parties they support the kind of uh, i mean their political leanings and stuff like that mm -hmm. so so i think there are two um two sides to think about that and and i mean the first side is um if, you, if you're looking at at, at 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 an account that that for example um likes the the liberal party or that likes uh the social democrats or so um if, you, if you're thinking about germany so um then the question is what does that signal tell me so 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 in a very naive way you could be saying ah that person of course supports that party um but it could also be that you have a, a social democrat who who's basically very annoyed by the liberals and thereby he's also she's also following the liberals just to be better able to earn them or to to make screenshots um to to learn about them so um so so it's difficult um from the outside just by looking at the signals to then say um okay that one signal means this um what of course might be possible that you that you look at at, at, at continuous interaction of that uh, of that account and then be able to 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 score that person with a um, um, with with a given likelihood, um, but um, but there I would be very um, I, I would be hesitant about the um, about the the practicality um, of the thing. Um, so of course our signals tell tell something about us what we're what we're doing, but it's on the outside it's difficult. Um, to to make sure that that these signals actually mean what we think they mean. So often that is used. Um, I mean, why we're we interested in this? I think there are two two reasons for this. One is I think more or more 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 advantageous than the other. So um, a lot of the early work on social media, on politics, on social media, tried to look at at publicly visible. Um, uh, signals of people, so for example, hashtags that refer to specific parties or to specific campaign um, uh, campaign events, and um, and you then basically said, okay, look, I, I counted that, and I see um, the Democrats have much more Twitter mentions than the Republicans, so the Democrats will be winning the election campaign. So that I think is a very problematic way of of using these signals because. Um, of course, you have no idea how, um, as I said, why people are posting these these hashtags. So is that actually support or is that criticism or is that actually um, kind of just by making fun of these uh, of these actors? Um, or is it um, yeah, or is it actual? Yes, I support those and therefore I'm using these hashtags. So so that is one problem. The other problem is that with everything um, connected with digital, we know that um, only a very few amount of very, very active people are pushing the majority of the content. Um, so, so simply by, by looking at, at the hashtags or the, 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 the names of, of candidates online, that might actually just mean, okay, look, there are 5% of really, really active people who basically don't have much of a life and they're pushing all this content. So there, you are kind of follow, following their um, their activities or their um, their interests, or you and 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 thereby kind of letting your judgment kind of be clouded by that. So so all of that I think is good reasons not to use these data as a as a public opinion measurement. Of course, there are then complicated statistical procedures that you can run on this, but none of these procedures actually kind of clears clears these basic problems that are connected with that. Um, the other way of using that, that that might be more helpful, and I think that's connected to, to your previous question is, um, of course, I can use these signals in identifying people that might be interesting for me to contact. So because if I have somebody on Facebook who says, okay, look, I like the Liberal Party, 
um, then, then you as the Liberal Party, um, you can use that information to display ads to that person or to, to display ads to, to the social environment of that, of that person. Um, and, and, and thereby you, you basically reach people who are probably amenable to your message, um, but you, that you otherwise would not be able to contact. Um, and, and I think that is something, um, again, this is not a, a surefire way of reaching the people that you want to reach, but, but I think this is a very helpful way of, uh, of getting in touch with people and identifying people that you as a campaign might be interested in, um, in interacting with. Um, and especially at the time like now, um, where, where, where kind of party membership is going down, it becomes much more difficult um, to, to, to get people on, uh, to, to meet people in, um, in on offline environments or uh, through clubs or social associations. Um, that is something that, 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 that is helpful for parties to actually identify the universe of people that is of interest to them. So not because they for sure know that there is a supporter there, but simply because they know that maybe the likelihood that you have somebody there who's in, who is interested in, in what you have to present or so, or who's connected with people like that person who then might also be interested in this. Um, I think that is something that, that then um, social media allows us or allows campaigns to do. Um, and, and I think that might be very valuable. Mm -hmm. Why is it that in your work you focus so much on Twitter? I mean, is, are there specific reasons for that? Is that, that because of the way that platform works or the way people interact there renders it a better place to study political behavior? Is it because there's more political content there or something else? Yeah, I think, I mean, there are, um, I think the, 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 there are a number of reasons for that and some are better than others. So let's start with the not so good reasons. Um, I think it's a little bit like the, like the drunk with the, who, who lost his key and, and then basically looks under the streetlight. So, um, so Twitter is a comparatively open um, digital communication environment. So um, Twitter as a company with all the issues that are connected with, uh, with Twitter has been, um, has been rather open with academics regarding the, the quality of data access that you're getting. And then also, of course, then the reliability of the data that you that you can build on that, um, and that is that is important for two reasons. So for one, um, it means that you can actually can do your primary research, but on the other hand, you can also provide other researchers with the with the opportunity to to check on your results, um, and and to replicate the findings. So if you're thinking, for example, about Facebook, Facebook has also tried to be more open to researchers and to develop better. Um, 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 better, um, better connections there. They do so through privileged partnerships and and rather complicated um, uh, kind of uh, data protection and and privacy agreements. And there are good reasons for that because Facebook is of course a um, a, a a closed platform where you as an individual um, you have a you have an expectation of privacy. So Facebook cannot open itself up like like Twitter does for the public uh, messages. But it brings the problem on the one hand of access. So, so who are the researchers who are privileged enough to get access in the first place? And then the other other question becomes, okay, even if Facebook manages that smartly and they, they, they have tried to do that, um, then, uh, then the question becomes, how can I replicate that? So, so, so I think one of the biggest issues and um, or the, one of the biggest progresses that we have seen in, in social science over the last few years was the push towards open science. So, so that replication is a very, very important element of science. And, and that is something that you can get to with platforms like Reddit or, or Twitter, who are open or Wikipedia research um, that allow you to do this in principle. Um, and then you have other platforms like, like Facebook um, that are much more difficult in that regard. So, um, so I would argue there are good reasons from, from research practicality issues uh, to be focusing on this. Um, but also the other, an another reason is that because Twitter is so open, it is also the, the channel that is driving political discourse because not only we scientists are looking at it, but also journalists are looking at it, also politicians are looking at it. So if we are, as scientists are kind of understanding the dynamics that is happening here, there, it also helps us to, to, to quantify or to discuss the biases 
that other social actors might have looking at that um, at that channel. And of course, Facebook um, has been has been seen as a as a big driver of um, of misinformation, um, and and that is again then if you're looking at the science, that is then in doubt how how much that is done really was, but. But there, there are reasons to expect that that a lot of interesting stuff is happening on Facebook or relevant stuff is happening on Facebook. But this is stuff that that is much more kind of that is not only hidden from scientists but also hidden from political actors. And if we are if we are we are better at understanding Twitter, then we also be better at understanding what what kind of problematic uses of Twitter might be that kind of shift the the the, the political voice or what is covered or what is not covered. If other actors are using that, and I think that is a slightly better justification um, to be looking uh, to be looking at Twitter than uh, than the than the argument of the um, of the drunk and the streetlight, um, and um, yeah. So 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 I think there the um, practicality, but also kind of relevance. Mm -hmm. But since we started our conversation by talking about our social media changes the way people interact with one another or how it might change the way people interact with one another. I mean, is it that because the way people are allowed to communicate on Twitter, I mean, with that comparatively limited number of, uh, I mean, of characters per, per tweet, I mean, does that change or do we know that changes in any way the way people share information and communicate? Um, I haven't seen kind of psychological studies that are looking at that. So so you would be I mean, you would be interested in in seeing um, uh, is, is, for example, um, uh, does your um, does your pursuit ability kind of or does the media effect change if you see something in an article or if you see that in a um, just in a tweet? Um, so, so I'm not sure about, um, let's say, the psychological effects. Um, but I think, I mean, what we what we what we can see if we look at the content, um, and if we're seeing um, if 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 we're seeing, for example, what happens in in connection to to political debates, um, where where Twitter is is a, is a very big kind of um, second channel where where you where you kind of not only watching a political event but you're also watching the reaction to the event and um and i think there are quite a few studies who are showing that that kind of by being aware of what 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 this kind of back channel twitter um is saying or seems to be saying um to to a debate that this is shifting the way you are you're perceiving the event yourself so um so i think there's something um there that simply by knowing that other people react to something or seemingly reacting to something um, that this shifts um, that this shifts your opinion. On the other hand, it also uh, shifts the way that that media um, is presenting their um, or uh, media organizations are presenting their stories, um, because Twitter is of course also a very very important channel um, that drives attention towards articles and and to media content. So. So I think there, there there's a lot of continued activity there in in thinking about how does my um, headline work, how does the uh, how does the teaser work, um, and um, and this might also then not only kind of um, be true for tabloid journalism, but this might also be true uh, for for more um, let's say quality media that in the past would have would have the longer sentences and the more complicated words and stuff um, that then kind of also equalize that their approach to 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 headlining um, when they're when they're using Twitter. So so there this kind of logic of, of being shorter using these um, those conventions like hashtags and so um, surely influences how other content is produced. Um, and finally, I think there's also um, that argument that that you also find and that's not only true for Twitter, but also if you're thinking about um, political conversations on Reddit or so um, on other forums, um, that 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 there's of course a lot of. I mean, if we're talking about politics, we 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 often talk about it quite seriously, but these are also channels that people use for entertainment. And making fun of people, and um, especially, and 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 the best way of making fun of uh, is to make fun of earnest people. 
Um, so, um, so, so you you find a lot of satirical content there, a lot of sarcasm, um, and uh, and also kind of a, um, a tendency to make fun uh, or make like light of events, and so that then might also shift the way we are perceiving uh, politics. Um, and um, and and I think once once as a candidate you you end up in um, in that maelstrom. And you don't necessarily know how to react to that or, or get free of that. That could be also dangerous. So, so I think these are issues that um, that that the channel and, and the logic that is connected with the channel um, has then different different effects on on politics or political discourse. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's one aspect of politics I haven't asked you about yet. Uh, I mean. In in on uh, in an online platform so can twitter be used and is it used for activism sure sure i, I think i mean um we see that um i think i think we see that very very strongly so um, um we in fact i mean one of the first uh, first episodes that uh, that people started to talk about twitter and taking it seriously um, was uh, was its perceived role in the Arab Spring, um, and, um, and, uh, and and also in, in, in protests in uh, in Russia, for example. So so there was a moment um, when uh, when when big international protest events or collective action events was were very much connected um, with uh, with Twitter. Then of course there's then after that there's always then the debate. Okay, how how big was truly the role that that um, Twitter had in these events, but I think what you what you can definitely um, can say is that activists can use Twitter very very well in in kind of um, getting attention or getting the word out about um, about the event itself. Um, so so publicizing that. Um, also, I think um, uh, and, and and there's been there's been great research on this uh, in the U.S. Um, uh, there, there, there's a great book um, by um, by Jackson and colleagues uh, where where they talk about hashtag activism, where where they look at episodes um, um, of Black Lives Matter or, or other protest events in the U.S. Um, how the hashtag was used to generate kind of collective um, collective identity and 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 create kind of a um, an umbrella term that that different um, protests around the country could be uh, could be connected to. Um, then there's also earlier work by Lance Bennett and Alexandra Zigerberg, um, who then talk about connective action, who who talk about how how digital media is allowing a more personalized version of activism to uh, to emerge or something um, where where you can connect yourself with with uh, with symbols. That become powerful, that are some sometimes somewhat playful, um, and, um, and 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 thereby kind of open up um, kind of connection points for for people who want to kind of support a cause or who feel connected by by the content or the um, the the way the protest is looking, um, and and thereby kind of generating support. So um, so all of these are areas where um, where where digital media. Has a very strong operative um, kind of relevance for for protest. And going further, I think I mean there's there's great work by by Janis Theocharis and Jan van Det, um, who approach this more from a traditional participation um, aspect, where they're saying, okay, in the past we have thought about political participation in a given way. So those were kind of then big demonstrations. Uh, this was all very heady stuff that was that was happening there. Um, and 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 we have come to look down on on the lighter version or the more kind of also a little bit um, uh, the uh, a little a little ex more accessible version um, of of activism online, um, and they are arguing very forcefully, and they show um, uh, um, they show the data also that 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 these digital media have have become part of a, a participatory repertoire. Um, of um, of activists and also up, opening up a new form of activism that is um, that is available there. So, so I think it's it's very clear um, that 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 digital media um, can be used very strongly within activism um, and and in in getting the word out about your cause, 
um, in, in creating visibility also in, in more kind of restrictive regimes. Um, if you if you have then police brutality, for example, that you can document there and get the word out. Um, but also in creating kind of that shared identity uh, among protesters and their supporters and, and then maybe then create a larger um, larger base of support uh, within the population of people who are not necessarily at that time at that place. So um, so I, th I think these are powerful uh, functions and within activism, um, how it can help. This being said, digital media is only one element or one toolkit within participation. And I think that is also something um, that we're seeing, I've been recently seeing, uh, for example, with the Occupy protests or so, which were very, very strong um, symbolically and who were very strong uh, on, on digital media, but then had trouble in translating this um, this attention that they got and, and the activity and the energy that they generated online into real political action or into uh, channel that into into the political process. So um, so I think that there's also then a danger there um, that 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 you that you say, OK, look, we had this we had this amazing Twitter event, um, but uh, and we, we had these many people out on the street. But we then didn't think it through how to how to connect that with the political process or with institutions. Um, and then follow through on what we are, what we're actually demanding. And I think that is also one of the weaknesses that um, that this kind of um, that that the hashtags mean, because basically everybody can connect something that they that they think. Um, so if you're thinking of Occupy, we all have a sense of injustice that we somehow can connect with that. But if we then come together and have to have to actually argue about what type of injustice are we talking about? Um, so what are we actually occupying um, and and what do we really want to change in the world um, to translate that into political action that then becomes much more difficult. And um, and 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 I think we have seen a lot of protests that were very strong with that first element and then had issues uh, regarding um, regarding the follow through. Um, so, so so I think it's important to, on the one hand, recognize the very real opportunities connected with these digital media, but then on the other hand, also remain aware that um, that these opportunities alone do not make for a uh, political success. For the political success, that also then needs the second step. And I think um, Dave Karp, uh, the American uh, scholar who who has done a lot of pioneering work on on how um, participation and 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 um, collective action organizations. Are working with digital media, I think he's been very strong on that and in, in emphasizing it's, it's not necessarily a um, a an organize a, a, a kind of a, a politics without organizations, but it's a politics with different organizations because you still need organizations that then connect that energy uh, to the political process um, itself. And sometimes the critique of social media is is, is kind of Look, Occupy didn't change anything much um, with regard to inequality in the U.S., for example. So digital media and ha hashtag activism, that is not a thing. Um, Who is interested in that? Um, and I think that is wrong because there are real opportunities and um, connected with these tools. And those were realized. But then the second step was actually something different and and um, and not necessarily primarily connected to digital media that then also has to be successful um, and and failing at the second step does not necessarily mean that the opportunities connected at the first step are not real or are not powerful mm -hmm. so uh, is online misinformation a big problem and i mean of course this is a very condensed question that we could perhaps divide into several others because we could ask, for example, is there lots of fake news circulating online and is there are there lots of people exposed to them, lots of people that share them, or then even if by being exposed to them that has uh, actual behavioral effects, like for example now with all the COVID situation, being exposed to anti-vax content, if that really leads people to become anti-vaxxers and being vaccine hesitant or something like that. I mean, 
what what are your thoughts on this kind of uh, um, I know I mean on the impact that online misinformation has? Yeah, I think I mean that that is a very very interesting uh, question, and you had great people um, on your channel talking about uh, about that who, uh, who have much more primary uh, research experience on this than I do. Um, so so my impression is that we um, uh, it's a little bit like like. Um, like the extremism thing that we talked about in the beginning. Um, my feeling is that, um, that that misinformation is probably not as widespread as, as we can um, get the impression if we're, if we're following uh, if we're following the news. Um, so, so, so I would argue that that misinformation is probably not a societal wide um, problem or that that is a, uh, that is a danger to the average um, internet user or to the average citizen. So this being said, um, I think we 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 need to think a little bit more um, more clearly about um, what is happening in situations of of uncertainty. So um, so if we're having a political campaign, um, I would argue misinformation is probably not that much of an issue because you have a lot of um, very powerful actors who are uh, continuously countering that misinformation. So, um, so even if there there might be some people exposed to misinformation online, um, I'm I'm sure that they are they they will be meeting a lot of information that is countering that. Um, so 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 I would argue if they don't have an inclination already to believe the misinformation, so if, if we are not already politically committed, um, then then I think the the informational value of that or the persuasive value of that will be rather limited. Um, but if we're now moving in a situation um, like um, like like we're like we're having now with the epidemic, where where there's some uncertainty, and uh, and where in the past also, um, if you're thinking at the early days of the pandemic, when the official sources were basically saying don't wear masks, um, so there is no pandemic out there. So um, so so if you're if you're thinking back at that at a point where you where you thought okay look. Maybe the traditional media or the traditional institutions are not up to task to deal with that. So I don't do not necessarily find the the best information there. Um, then of course you you send out people who start searching for information. Um, and and I think in, in in a situation like that, there are of course also very real health risks associated with that. Um, but again, um, I mean if I'm if I'm thinking about the the COVID situation. Um, I think I mean there there has been it, it took a while but but then I think um, we actually saw that the institutions and the traditional media um, was very strong in, in in thinking through okay how can we how can we deal with that how can we provide specific information valuable information and how can we counter um, wrong uh, information that is out there so 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 I would argue that traditional media probably wasn't up 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 to speed in the in the first few months of the pandemic, but then has become much better at providing information. So um, so again, you probably find more information, more correct information out there than misinformation or wrong information. And I think then you come to a point when you have to think about why am I inclined to believe this? So why am I inclined, for example, if you're thinking about health information, uh, why am I inclined to believe that um, sitting under UV light or drinking bleach might be a good strategy of dealing with this? Um, and and I think there, for example, you're thinking about the US, there you suddenly come to a situation where you have political actors um, or the then President Donald Trump who, who who had the opinion that he would win an election if if he could kind of push simple narratives um, simple solutions and and kind of um, uh, minimize the, the the perceived problem. So believing that is then not um, you, you're not believing that you should be using UV light to fight COVID because you read it on the internet. You believe it because a political um, a political actor that you trust or that you feel affiliated with is saying that. So you're following an elite signal and not necessarily um, are perceived by 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 digital um, by digital media, 
um, channel. Um, so, so what I'm saying there is that yes, misinformation is out there, and and there are some situations in which is probably more dangerous than others for the individual. Um, but um, but but my impression is that that there's always an underlying reason for people to then believe something, repeat something, or even act on something, um, and 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 that might be kind of a already existing hesitancy um, towards science and, and and medicine or institution uh, institutionalized medicine, um, or kind of. You believe a political um, a political faction is kind of making it not into kind of a factual issue or kind of um, a question of right or wrong, but a question of you're with us or you're against us. So um, it's not about uh, wearing masks. It's not about keeping healthy or protecting others, um, but it's actually about um, signaling your allegiance to a specific cause. And so there we are then again back to the back to the beginning. Um, when, when the question is, yes, these political conflicts and these societal conflicts take place online and, 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 and digital media are a part of them. Um, but at the same time, um, the, the underlying cause might be something, uh, might be something different. So, um, so I'd be, be, I'd be, I'd be very interested in, um, in studies, uh, which I hope that are done, um, that are looking at the motives of, of anti-vaxxers in different countries um, to 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 follow these information or to believe that information or to distrust the other information because I think there you then have the um, then you the, there you then have the reason uh, for for how these information can can develop and an effect or so. Mm -hmm. So for example, and I think this is important for also for science communicators when people are exposed to people who communicate misinformation or, for example, they are exposed to a particular news piece and they get convinced that vaccines don't work or something like that, I, I guess that they shouldn't immediately assume that the issue there is a matter of the person being stupid or lacking enough knowledge, but uh, perhaps it would be better to try to understand the motivations behind it in terms of, for example, political affiliations. Yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely. So, so, so I think, I mean, we know that also from, from climate communication, for example. So it's often not about the facts or it's often not about people not understanding what you're saying. Um, it's 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 a little bit when when you're in a foreign country and and you uh, you start talking in your in your own language and nobody understands you so you start talking louder and more slowly um, that won't solve the problem um, so 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 here I would argue that that what we know from from these um, I mean what we know from climate communication for example it's it's more about understanding the other and 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 finding commonalities on which basis you can then um, argue um, the case. So give them a reason to trust you or find somebody they already trust who then tells them, okay, look, um, there's a reason uh, why, why, this, um, why, why vaccination might be actually helpful or wearing a mask is, is not a sign of political defeat um, or socialism. Um, so, so, uh, so in the US, find, find a clearly, uh, clearly aligned Republican who then um, who then argues in favor of vaccination and in favor of um, of mask wearing, because because then it has become and we're talking a lot of identity politics, but I think there you have a point where where you need to find something connective. You need to find a source that these people um, already trust, and and you need to find um, and and have then that person communicate that that point. Or on the other hand, the other thing is you need to you need to identify the root cause. So why are people hesitant? And and often um, and often we say, oh, they saw it on Facebook, so Facebook made me do it. Um, but there is yeah there, there's a reason behind why people believe that person more uh, or trust that person more than um, uh, than 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 all medical doctors that you can find so um so and and then you get to you have to understand that reason and then you have to address that one mm -hmm. so just one last question so we've been talking about 
politics online, people's political behavior. And I mean, I guess that we've also been highlighting the fact that this kind of research is difficult, it has limitations, and we have to be careful when it comes to drawing general conclusions about it. So would you have any message to people like, for example, people that are uh, politically motivated, not because they are partisans, but because they find it valuable to be informed on politics. And so they draw information mainly online. They go to Facebook or Twitter, and that's where they get most of their news. And then they get desperate because they see, quote unquote, uh, lots of people uh, saying stupid things, extreme things and stuff like that. I mean, because uh, I, I mean, of course, we have our own personal experience, but then the data usually tells something different. So what would you have to say to those people when they go online and they are exposed to that for them to not become cynical, let's say? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, the, 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 um, the, the first and golden rule of, uh, of the Internet is don't read the comments. Um, so, um, so, so, so I think there, there is something there in, um, uh, in, uh, in, in being careful what you listen to. So, so I think, um, I think something, um, very powerful, um, in, in learning to deal with digital communication or with the internet is, is to, to identify, uh, to, to identify, where you um, where you should be filtering um, and what you should be listening to and what you shouldn't be listening to. So, um, so, 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 so I think, um, I mean, if you're thinking about the echo chamber and the filter bubble, um, there the the thinking was always that the internet would be dangerous because it would be hiding those people who believe other things um, from us. Um, I think that has not been the case. Um, I think the internet has been um, very strong in, in actually showing us the political other continuously and all the time. And I, yeah. I think Jamie Settle has a, has a wonderful book about that, Frenemies, where she's talking about the actual um, challenges uh, that, that arise from continuously being reminded that there's a political other and that the political other might not be basing their opinion on the best available evidence. Um, and and I think that is something that that I think one uh, one probably should uh, should not spend too much time worrying about um, because a lot of what we're seeing online is performative. Um, so so you're not necessarily sure that the person who is um, uh, who's posting these outr outrageous comments and these obviously stupid um, ideas and and links to stuff that nobody can believe that this person is doing that seriously, um, especially if you're, if you're moving into comment sections of very, very prominent um, news articles, for example, or on, for or, uh, on forums. Um, what you're seeing there is for a lot of people, it's a game. And, and I think for, for everybody who enters that um, uh, from, a, uh, fr from a serious perspective, then this can be really uh, uh, anxiety inducing. Um, but but there I would be more um, probably more critical about what you're seeing uh, what you're seeing there um, if you don't want to engage it as a game. So if you want to engage it as a game, of course, feel free. Um, but I think that is that is one thing. So so do not necessarily um, believe everything you read there and do not take that too uh, too seriously as an expression of what other people are saying and. I think there's something there, and I have to remind myself continuously as a as a researcher to do that. Um, find the best opposing argument. Um, so, uh, so if you're thinking about political discourse and political exchange and political others, I think it helps in thinking through. Okay, what might be the best motif behind that, or what might be the best version of that argument, or what might be the best reason to have that. Because that then allows you to respect the other and the other uh, the the other side. I think we academics need to do that uh, with regard to um, uh, citing other literature that is opposing our stance. So <laughs> find find the best way or the best version of that argument. So I think that helps. And and then I think the third is 
um, I think if, uh, I think I haven't seen recent numbers on that, but a few years ago there was a Pew study uh, in the U.S. that actually showed that even in the U.S., the country where we believe to have the most strongest political polarization, um, most people actually were agreeing on even hot button issues, mm -hmm. and they were yeah. actually rather um, rather indifferent about a lot of stuff, or had rather um, rather pragmatic opinions, for example, even even to questions like gun control. Um, and and I think the thing that we have to, as as commentators, journalists, and also politicians. Um, have to keep in mind that, that probably the the majority of the electorate does not necessarily care all that much about politics and is then also not all that divided on specific issues and can be actually convinced our problem is that we that that we do not listen to to that majority of people who are not all that interested in politics because they don't shout at you if you are at a at a political rally or they don't uh, don't don't uh, don't add you on um, uh, on Twitter when you're posting something. Those are then the people who who really have an issue that they really want to share, and um, and and those are then probably those people who are more set in their opinions that are that are more um, more extreme and also more ready to um, to to be hostile to others. And and I think we need to remind us that that the majority of people is not that way. And, and, and I think one of the challenges of political discourse is how to give those people who are more reasonable um, a voice and, 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 to, uh, and give them a choice and, and, and not to be drawn to the extreme by the louder voices uh, that, are, that are out there. Yeah. Okay, so Dr. Junger, just before we go, where can people find your work on the Internet? Um, yeah, I mean, so so I have a I have a, I have a website um, uh, andreasjunger.net, I think, uh, where where you find um, um, the the recent publications, or you can go also um, on on Google Scholar where you find the text. I'm I'm usually trying to uh, to go the open access route, so uh, so those who are um, inclined to <laughs> to uh, to uh, to uh, for the long form. Or for the long read, um, there, there should be some um, uh, some some stuff there. And otherwise, uh, I'm also out there on Twitter, um, hopefully not shouting at somebody. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. I will be leaving links to all of that in the description box of the okay. interview. And thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I mean, well, it was a really nice chat. Thank you. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. Please consider supporting the show. It's thanks to people like you that it keeps running. I will leave links for Patreon and PayPal in the description box. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights Learning and Development Done Differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perga Larsen, Lagurero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunde, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whitting, Bordarno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Henry Kalenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingart, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, then Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassio, Arthur Kozup, Mark Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Sandman Colombo, George Pinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Robert, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormer, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cousin, Evan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Librant, Oslan Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T. Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weida, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Desaraujo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dimitri Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roff, Yannick Punter, Dana Rosmani, Charlotte Pliz, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Back, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, 
Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, My Producers, Isar Webb, James Frank, Lucas Tafini, Ian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Van Agdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Muller, Vega Guidi, Sardos France and Thomas Trumbull, and my executive producers, Michel Rogieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, and Sergio Codriano. Thank you for all. <laughs>